Right, so good afternoon again. So for today, I'm just going to focus on enzymes. So I'm going to spend about two hours. So if you can get you everything on enzyme and work a first paper question. So we're going to look at the definition, properties, factors, and their inhibition. One more their mechanism of action. So you should know all of these. All right, so we all know that enzymes are proteins, but we can specify it. So enzymes are double, um, enzymes are tubular proteins. All right, so that's where we start off. So let's look at the properties now. So. All right, enzymes, because they are catalysts, if you do chemistry or if you don't do it, speed up our reaction, they lower the activation energy.
All right, so I'm going to use this graph to show the effect of the enzyme in terms of activation energy. All right, so remember now, so for any reaction to occur, the molecules must meet the activation energy. So that's the minimum amount of energy needed for the reaction to proceed. So the black line here, all right, sorry. So on the y-axis, that's the energy of the molecules. So you have the energy here. So this black line, that is the activation energy without the catalyst. I'm putting Ea for activation energy without the catalyst, which in this case is the enzyme. I'm going to put without the enzyme because enzymes are catalysts. And the blue line now, is the reaction with the enzyme. So that would be the activation energy with the enzyme. So all this graph is showing is that the enzyme lowers the activation energy for a particular reaction. So if you remember an enzyme, it will, it will work on a substrate and convert it into the product. So this right here, so from here to here, that's the activation energy without any enzyme. If you include the enzyme now, the activation energy is lowered. Yeah. So that is what this graph is showing. The effect on enzyme and activation energy. Can you make a bridge? Can you make a bridge? Can you make a bridge? All right, so I'll give you a minute to write this off and then we'll look at the properties of the enzyme.
Right, just if you haven't finished writing, just take a screenshot of the board from it. All right, so just take a screenshot if you haven't finished. I'm going to clear it. All right, so we are finished with this part. I'm going to do mechanism of action. All right, so we know that the job of the enzyme, all right, I'm just put mechanism of action. So we know that the job of the enzyme is to convert a substrate into a product. And at the end of the reaction, of course, you will get back the enzyme. The two mechanisms that you should know is the lock and key mechanism and the induced fit hypothesis. So we're going to start with lock and key. So in this method, right, not method, in this mechanism, as the name of it suggests, lock and key. So if you think of the enzyme, so in this one, the enzyme is the lock, all right? So let us say this is a lock, all right? So if we have different types of keys, let us say this is a key, this is a key and then a key looking like that. So if these are all keys, then you can this would be the key all. And of these three keys, number one, number two, and number three. We know that key number two would be the one to fit inside of it. All right. So the key all is specific for a particular key. Not any key will fit into the key all of a lock. All right. So in the lock and key mechanism, the enzyme is the lock. All right. So in this mechanism, the lock is the enzyme. And the keys would be the substrate. And the key all, it would have been the active site.
So what this is showing you is that the enzyme is specific for a certain substrate. So not every substrate molecule will fit into the active site of your enzyme. All right, so let's go a little right in. Right. I'm going to erase this part. I need this. No, you don't have to remember this word for word. If you can remember that the enzyme is the lock, the key hole is the active site, and the key is the substrate, you can put it in your in your own words.
So I'm going to clear the screen in a couple seconds or in a minute. All right, so let's use a diagram to represent this equation up here. All right, if you were not finished writing, just take a screenshot. All right, so I'm allowing you to take a screenshot and then I erase it. All right. All right, so let us say this is our enzyme. It will react with our substrate. All right, so if this is the enzyme, this part here, it would be the active site. And so the substrate must have a shape to fit the active site. So this is our substrate. When the enzyme binds with the substrate, it forms a complex called the, called the enzyme substrate complex. So we're going to get an intermediate. All right, so this is the enzyme substrate complex. So this is how the enzyme, it actually works. So it binds with the substrate to form the enzyme substrate complex. So this is where it actually works on the substrate and convert it into a product. The product is, it will have a different shape from the substrate. So once this substrate is converted into a product, it is released. And so at the end of the process or at the end of the reaction, what you will have is your enzyme. And the product. I'm just going to use a, a different shape for the product. Right. Here I have enzyme and product. And so this same enzyme again now, if it was a reaction being carried out, this same enzyme could work on a next substrate again. Of course, it has to be the same substrate, but a different molecule. You have your enzyme, it binds, the substrate, you get your enzyme substrate complex. 
the enzyme converts the substrate into okay. your product. All right, so that is how the enzyme catalyzes the reaction.
at the end of step three, where it says the conversion of this substrate into, into product, the enzyme catalyzes the conversion of the substrate into products, just include activation energy output by lowering the activation energy. So it catalyzes the conversion of the substrate into products by lowering the activation energy of, um, of the reaction. So if it is if it is catalyzing it, that means it is lowering the activation energy. All right, so take a screenshot if you haven't finished as yet. I'm going to share the screen. All right, so the next one we're going to look at is the induced fit hypothesis. Remember, before we move to that one, the lock and key, it assumes that the enzyme, it has a specific shape and the substrate also has a specific shape that, that is just perfect for the active side of the enzyme. The induced fit views it a bit different No, whether it's induced fit or lock and key, this, these steps here, one to five, it will be the same. The induced fit and the lock and key, it just looks at all the enzyme and the substrate bind to each other. So once they bind, the same thing will happen. They get the enzyme substrate complex, the substrate is converted into products and is released. So the difference is just how the enzyme and the substrate actually bind to each other. That is where we have the, the difference. All right, I want you to think of, so the induced fit, right? In this one, all right, let me put a diagram on the board. So that's not good. I just use your imagination, all right? Okay. And then, let me do this. So 
So we're looking at induced fit now. So let us say you have a non-stretch, it's not stretchable. So let me just say you have one material that you are not able to stretch, all right? And one that is flexible or non-flexible material. So it can stretch, all right? So it can stretch, right? So if you order a size, a particular size, a person A, it should not be able to fit person B, all right? If you order a material that is not able to stretch, all right? For person A, it should not be able to fit person B. And if you buy the material for person B or the clothes for person B, it should be too big for person A. Now what the induced fit hypothesis is suggesting is that the enzyme becomes flexible. So basically, if you buy the clothes for person A, because the material it can stretch, it will stretch to fit the shape of person B. Person A and B are of different size, but the clothes it's going to change its shape to fit whether it's person A or B. All right, so it's person A, it will not stretch as much. If you put it on person B, then it is going to stretch to accommodate the shape of person B. The key thing here is that it is changing its shape to fit the particular person. In this case, the persons are the substrate. All right. So the persons, they are the substrate. Substrate one, substrate two. But it doesn't matter how they shape the enzyme. So the material that is flexible, so the flexible material, that is the enzyme. So it will fit either persons because it will just change its configuration to fit the person. All right, so I'm just checking for this one. Do you understand it? Just checking. If you have any question, you can ask, all right? So the key difference here is that in this one, the enzyme is going to change its shape to fit the substrate. We are not viewing it that the substrate is specific for the enzyme, but, but rather the enzyme is going to change its shape to fit the substrate. Mm -hmm. So let me put that in words. Yes, it, yes, the active site, right, it will change because that is where the enzyme is going to, sorry, that is where the substrate is going to bind. So it has to change to accommodate this substrate. And so let us do an example, our diagram to see what it looks like. All right, so again, let us say this is our enzyme.
So again, let us say this is our enzyme and this is our substrate. So clearly, this substrate cannot fit this up each side. So what would happen is that the enzyme would need to adjust its shape to probably something like this. All right. And so the substrate can now fit inside of it. So this is the active site. This is the substrate. Notice the active site has changed shape. So that is the key difference between lock and key and induced fit. Lock and key tells us that the substrate has the specific shape for the active site. So this would be the lock and key. But with the induced fit, the substrate don't have the specific shape. But the active site, right, it will change its shape to accommodate the particular substrate, all right? So that is the difference between lock and key and induced fit. How does it change shape? So it would have to be, so remember enzymes are proteins, right? And when so someone asks, how does the active side change shape? Once the enzyme is going to, change shape, the bonds that are presently there. So remember, of ionic interactions of hydrogen bonding, that if the three dimensional shape, the protein intact, the enzymes are protein and proteins are folded into three dimensional shapes. So that means the bonds will have to break change its configuration. So when we look at, so you can view it as how you view denaturation of the enzyme. When the enzyme is denatured, it's changing its shape, which means that bonds are broken. If it is going to accommodate, once it is changing its shape, a bond has to break, all right? So basically the bonds that holds the 3D structure together, some of them has to break in order for the conformation of it to change. Understand the person that asked? Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. Okay. All right, so let me just write something now below it for the induced fit.
All right, so you can, I'm going to clear the screen now. So if you haven't finished writing, just take a screenshot. All right, so we know about the definition, we know about the lock and key and induced fit hypothesis. I'm going to look at the factors now that affect enzyme. So oh, we're going to do that in the next session for next week. I'm just doing enzymes today. We're going to do the other topics in a different session. We have four factors that affect enzyme. We have enzyme concentration, substrate concentration,
temperature and pH. So these are the four factors that you need to know how they affect the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Let's start with enzyme concentration. And so if you look at this graph, so we have concentration on the x-axis and rate of reaction on the y-axis. So you can see that as we increase the concentration, the rate of the reaction is increasing. All right, so why is that happening? Let us look at two, two containers. If you have container A and container B. So remember now with this graph, your substrate concentration must stay constant but we are increasing the concentration of the enzyme. So let us say we have three substrate molecules. So these are the substrates in the container, all right? Three substrates in each of them. So the substrate concentration, it must stay constant. Now the enzyme concentration, I'm going to put two enzymes in this container. All right, for the rate of our reaction to increase, it means that the enzyme must be colliding with the substrate. They cannot just collide, but when they collide, they have to do so in the correct orientation. That means if this substrate hits this enzyme in this fashion, a reaction will not occur. Remember, it only takes place when the enzyme, when the substrate binds to the active site. In the container, the enzyme and the substrate will be colliding. But no reaction will occur unless you get an enzyme substrate complex. And to get the enzyme substrate complex, it has to bind to the active site. It's not just about colliding. It's about colliding in the correct orientation. So if you have three substrates and two enzymes, and in this one, you have four substrates, sorry, three substrates. Let me put the next enzyme. In which of these two containers, A or B, which one do you think more collisions will take place in? You can take the answer if you don't want to speak aloud. So this container A, it has three substrate, two enzyme. All right, so everyone is saying B, right, that is correct. 
So if more collisions are occurring in B, which container will have the which container will have faster rate? If it's A or B, which one will have a faster rate? B, exactly. So I am showing you this diagram that you'll see that is the reason why as you increase the, subs the enzyme concentration, the rate of the reaction will increase. Because once you increase collision, what you are doing is increasing the chances of getting an enzyme substrate complex. So the quicker you get your enzyme substrate complex, the faster the rate will be because it's the enzyme substrate complex that will lead to the formation of the products. All right. So the more enzyme substrate complex you can form, the faster the rate of reaction. So as you increase enzyme concentration, the amount of collisions that are taking place is going to increase, all right? And so the rate will increase. Also, if you look at this, right, you only have two enzymes here. You have more enzyme than, sorry, you have more substrate than enzyme. That means when these two substrate bind these two enzymes, this one will actually have to wait until one of these reactions has been completed for it to be converted into products. All right, so for that reason, when you increase concentration, the rate of reaction is going to increase. I'm going to clear the screen and put it in words. So I will allow you to pick off the graph and if you want to take the diagram as well. All right, so I'll give you a minute to do that and then I'm going to clear the screen. All right, I'm going to share the screen now. Let's erase this. So we are doing enzyme concentration. So there are two things that you can be asked, right? You can just be asked to state the effect of enzyme concentration and rate. So if you're asked to state the effect, you do not offer any explanation. All you need to say as enzyme Concentration increases the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction increases. So notice I did not offer any explanation because all they said was to state the effect. So the effect is as the concentration increases, the rate of the reaction also increases. Now, if they ask you to explain now, that is where we tell what is actually happening.
Your graph, this will only occur if the number of substrate is high. If you get a graph that's showing enzyme concentration and you see it is tapering off, that means substrate concentration is low. So it is limiting the rate. So if you get a graph where you see its rate versus enzyme concentration, you get a straight line and you see part a curve or a broken line, but there's a flat line. Where you have the flat line, the substrate concentration So when this substrate concentration is high, the enzymes, as you increase the concentration, the rate will be going up. But if you see that the rate is getting constant, it means that the amount of substrate has decreased. So it is limiting how fast the reaction can actually occur. So on a rate versus enzyme concentration graph, it is typically a straight line. But if you get one, we have the straight line, and you see it tails off. This part here means that the substrate concentration is low. So it is limiting the overall rate of the reaction. All right. So that is it for enzyme concentration. All right, I'm going to clear the board now. So 
if you don't finish writing, just take a picture or a screenshot. All right, so again, let us go back to our containers. All right, so what we're doing is, wait. we're looking at the effect of substrate concentration. Now, with this one, the substrate concentration, the enzyme concentration is going to stay constant. And we're going to increase the substrate concentration from one to the next. All right, so this is container A, which is container B. This is container. I'm going to do three containers. All right. All right, let us just say the circles are the substrate. All right, and I'm just going to put some triangles for the enzyme. So remember, it's substrate concentration. Substrate concentration must stay constant. And then we increase the enzyme concentration from one container to the next. All right, so remember this is the enzyme, and these are the substrate. So question, in which of these container do you think the rate is going to be the fastest, A, B, or C? C, right, because as you know, I know the more particles present, what we have to be careful is, is not just the more particles, but in this one, the more enzymes you have present, the faster the rate is going to be. So if you look at container A, you only have two enzymes. So again, collision has to take place, not just collision, collision in the correct orientation. So as you increase the concentration of the enzyme, you are increasing the chances of getting a correct collision, meaning one that leads to the formation of an enzyme substrate complex. So when you increase the concentration of the enzyme, you are increasing the chances of getting an enzyme substrate complex. So as you increase concentration, collision increase. And that increases your chances of getting an enzyme substrate complex. The quicker you get the complex, the faster the rate will be. So when I look at this, this has two enzymes that is going to be shorter. Well, it will take a longer time than when you have four enzymes to collide. And in this, you have C. 
six. So you know, I know, when you increase concentration, you literally see that they're increasing the amount of enzyme, the same amount of substrate. Collision increase, more enzyme substrate complex formed, rate increases. All right. If you want these diagrams, just take a screenshot. I am going to erase it and put it in, put it in words. All right, someone asks if B and C would have the same rate, it would not have the same rate for reason being, remember now, I can I see why you might ask that because you see four and you see six enzymes. So you're assuming that when you get four enzyme substrate complex here, you will get four here as well. And so these two enzymes would not be in use. I don't know. Oh, I was saying that someone asked if B and C wouldn't have the same rate. So the reason, I'm assuming that the reason why they ask, right? If you have four enzymes here, you would get four enzyme substrate complex. And you have six enzymes down here, but you only have four substrate. So you would still get four enzyme substrate complex. While that is correct, rate is how quickly you get them. So not because both of them are forming four enzyme substrate complex, which one is going to do it quicker? Because remember you now these, these reactions would have to be timed, but they are experiments. So let us say we are looking for a color change then, all right? and we're timing them for one minute, all right? So this one will not do four enzyme substrate complex in one minute. Let us say this one give you one, this one give you two, and this one give you three in one minute. So that is the importance of the rate. You are timing it for a specific period, all right? Eventually, all of them will form four. But in a given period, the one with the more enzyme, it would form it quicker. So we are not looking at the amount, we are looking at how quickly it forms it. Not that both of them can give four, but how quickly it does. All right, so I hope that cleared it up for you. Why this one would not have the same as this. All right. I'm going to clear this now and put it in words. All right. Also, just look to the, the right of your screen. Here, we have the flat line. When you see this here, it means that all of the enzyme oxides are used up. All right. So, they are, so for this one, basically, this is occupied with this. So these four are occupied, all right? And there are no more substrate to be catalyzed. So remember in the enzyme concentration one, when you add the horizontal line, it's because the substrate was limiting the rate of reaction. In this one, all of the enzymes sites are occupied. So there is nothing else to do. So the rate will flatline, basically, all right? Remember, you see these lines here, the vertical or plant line, it means that the reaction is still going on. You have more occupied enzymes, so the rate will increase. But once you get here, the 
enzymes active sites are occupied. All right. All right, so let me put that in words now and move on to the next two factors. Right, so just like before, I can ask you to state the effect. Wait a minute. Sorry. Just realize. View the other way around. Let me hold on. Don't take me pick up. If we're doing substrate concentration, wait. it is the enzyme that has to be constant. Of a substrate concentration, we want to see our substrate take it from one container. We have to increase the amount of substrate and keep the enzyme constant. All right, so just switch it around where the circles are the sub. Oh, that's how I have it. Wait, so sorry about that. When we're doing substrate concentration. The substrate must increase and the enzyme it must stay constant. Right. So this should have been the enzyme. So the enzymes stay constant throughout. But we increase the substrate. The explanation is the same, you know. You have more substrate, collision increase, you get more enzyme substrate complex. But it's just that for this, you keep the enzyme constant, and you keep the substrate, you keep increasing the substrate. All right. So for this flat line up here, it would be in container C. We have four enzymes, but they have more substrate. But the, the rate cannot go any further because all the active sites are used up. All right, so that was the correction. You keep the enzyme constant and you increase substrate. All right. All right, so state the effect.
All right, so this is your explanation over here in black. This here in blue is just explaining the horizontal part, why the rate is constant, if it does, all right? And let's say they ask you a question, right? So they give you the graph and ask you, what does this line mean? All right, well, you would know that the rate is constant. If they ask you what adjustments you could do, increase the rate again like that, then here in red, the answer. You would have to increase the enzyme concentration. So once the rate gets constant, if you want to increase it again, you would increase the enzyme concentration. That is when you are looking at the effect of substrate. If you were looking at the effect of enzyme, then when it gets constant, if you want to increase it again, you would increase the rate of the, sorry, you would increase the concentration of your substrate. All right, so that's it for the effect of concentration of substrate and enzyme. We are going to do pH and temperature. So I'll give you a minute, right? And then we'll move to pH. Sir, I have a question. Sure. In this case, would substrate concentration be the limiting factor or the enzyme concentration? The enzyme. Okay, sir. Yeah.
whichever whichever one you're looking at, the, the if you are looking at substrate concentration, enzyme is going to, to limit it. Right, and we can look so as once you use up all of the enzymes, then you cannot, there will be no further increase. So if you keep increasing the substrate, but the enzymes stay constant, it will reach a point where the enzymes will become saturated. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to share the board now. All right, so the graph for pH and temperature will have a bell shaped curve. So it's not like the enzyme, it's not like the enzyme and the, it's not like enzyme or substrate. All right, so now it's effect of pH. All right, so. All right, when it comes to pH and one temperature, enzymes have a particular pH at which they work best. What is that for the pH where the enzymes work best? What is that pH called? Anybody? The optimal pH. That is correct. And so on this graph, the optimum pH is where I would get my maximum rate, which would be here. I would identify this peak and draw a line to the y-axis. And whatever number is there, that would be my maximum rate. My optimum pH would be seven. Maximum rate would be here. So Vmax for my maximum rate, it would be the peak here. All right, so how does pH affect enzyme? When you come to pH now, you have to remember that enzymes are protein. And they are held together by certain forces, all right? 
example, let's say this is your protein. Let me see. All right, so it's folded. Let's say of, all right, I need to do it bigger. All right, so let's say this is a protein and it's folded, right? The reason why this can fold there, let's say you have an amino acid side chain here, right? NH3. The NH3, it will have a positive charge. And let's say down here, you have a particular side chain, which is COO minus. All right, this positive charge and this negative charge will attract each other. All right, so there will be an attraction. So that is what is holding this part here to this. But the reason why it curves like this is because of the bonding between the amino acid side chains from different parts of the polypeptide. So, look, um, so, when I did protein, you learned about primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. The primary structure would be the long chain of your polypeptide. It hasn't been folded yet. All right? So, this now can be folded by interaction. So, let me put NA3 here. All right? Positive. And let me put the COO minus here, all right? So this is able to fold by the interaction between amino acids, amino acids side chains, all right? Because I want you to understand what is actually happening. This is the structure of your amino acid, the general structure. It have a carboxylic group, C double bond O O H. So this is your acidic group. All right. And this is your basic group, NH2. All right. So when it is in a basic solution, this group here, it can be in a approach. Sorry. When it is in an acidic solution, this basic group here, even if you don't do chemistry, just know that when you put an amino acid, not an amino acid only. When I put a protein, acidic solutions, this group here and your protein, it is going to pick up a proton, which is hydrogen, all right? If I put this in acid, this is going to pick up a hydrogen and it is going to gain a positive charge, all right? So let us say before you put your acid or change the pH, this group, it was NH2, all right? If you put it in an acidic solution, it is going to gain a charge, all right? Um, let me just show you something else up here. Let us say this was NH2, right? And there was no interaction between these two because you get the interaction if this is negative and this is positive. All right, remember now, once you change the pH, how the enzyme is folded, it is going to change. And the reason for that, when you change the pH, the bonds are going to be adjusted. Let me explain now. Here, you have NH2. Give me a second. You have NH2, it does not have a charge. So this is representing one amino acid, right? Up here. This is the next one. Let us say you increase the pH of the solution. So it is a basic solution. In a basic solution, sorry, keep on saying that. Let's say you decrease the pH, right? It's an acidic solution. This group it will gain a hydrogen. When it gains the hydrogen, it will gain a positive charge. Now remember, these two did not have an interaction. But if you decrease the pH, means it gets acidic, 
all right? This is going to pick up hydrogen. And so it becomes NH3. Once that happens, this is going to gain a positive charge. Now these two groups that were not interacting before can interact, all right? And form a bond, good? So you have just changed something about the enzyme because these two were not bonding before. Now that they are bonding, the shape is going to change. You understand? Once you adjust the pH, these groups will be adjusted. And once they adjust, the bonding is going to change. And so the shape of your protein is going to change with the enzyme. All right. Now, let us say this is how we started out. Good. And you adjusted the pH by increasing it. So you make it become basic. This group here, this acidic group, it can pick up a hydrogen. If it gains a hydrogen, the negative charge is going to disappear because it is picking up a hydrogen. So there's no, this interaction between negative and positive, that's the ionic interaction. So if this gains a hydrogen, this interaction no longer exists. There is no longer an ionic interaction. So before it was positive and negative, and so you have that interaction. But now there is no negative charge, so there is no interaction again. This shape will change, all right? Is that clear? Any feedback? You, you can text if you have any question. No. All of this explanation is just to let you understand it for yourself. I will put it in words what you need to know, all right? So when I say that, when you change the pH of the solution, the bonds in the enzyme are going to break, and the enzyme changes shape, this is the result. When I say bonds are going to break, that is what actually happens. So it is the side groups of your amino acids that will change. All right, so this might become NH3 or NH2, depending on what you do. This might become COO minus or COOH, depending on the changes in pH. But just know that once you change the pH, these charged groups, something will happen. And once it change, the bonding is going to change. And so the overall shape of it is going to change. The changes in pH is affecting the amino acids. Remember, your active site it contains amino acids as well. All right? So pH, amino acids, their side chains are being changed, all right? And that causes the shape to change. All right? So if you don't have any question, I'm going to put it in words now. Give me a second. All right, let me erase this. All right, if you want to draw this, just take a picture. I'm going to erase it now. But if you want it, take a picture. I guess I can do it in my laptop.
All right, ready again. So in terms of this graph here, I'm going to state the effect like this. So as a pH, so what I'm doing is stating the effect. Somebody asked me a question.
Yes, yes, you can say that. Oh, no, nah, let's leave it. Right. Let me just add, well, it's there already. Green H, when the enzyme are, let me point out on the graph. This is the optimum, right? So the enzyme is working at its peak. This here, the enzyme is not denatured. Here, the enzyme is not denatured. It's still working. But enzymes, they have a range pH at which they can work. So the only time the enzyme is actually denatured is if you go far from the optimum. So for example, this enzyme, its, P, its optimum pH is seven. That means from here, can mark it here to about here. It's still good, all right? From here, it's almost basically denatured. Once you are getting a rate, it is still working. So it doesn't mean that once you see it starts, once you mean to pass the optimum, it is denatured. 
All right, that is not the case. Once you pass the optimum, it is not denatured. It is great. So denaturation, you can look at it as a gradual process where the enzyme, it starts to change shape. So the more you change the pH, the enzyme starts to change shape. So when you make a significant change now, that, it, that is when it completely loses its shape. So if it is not a significant change in pH, from the optimum, your enzyme is not going to be denatured. Its shape will change enough. So don't mix up the changing of the shape with denaturing. So once you change the pH, the enzyme, its shape will change. And that is where the rate will change. And for a pH graph, the best way to view it in terms of understanding it, start from up here. So start from pH seven, all right? pH seven is the maximum. When you go to pH six, you are moving away from the optimum. When you go to pH eight, you are moving away from the optimum. So if you view it from the optimum pH, you realize that going away from the optimum in any direction is causing the pH to, sorry, it is causing the rate to decrease. So going away from the optimum pH in either direction causes the rate to decrease. But even though when we look at the graph, we say that as pH increase, rate increase, that is true in a sense. But if you look at it from the, this perspective, from the optimum, you will realize that deviating from the optimum pH, the rate decreases. And that is what we put in the explanation. So once you change the pH, the bonding in the enzyme is going to change. So the rate automatically changes. It doesn't matter whether you increase it or decrease it. Any form of change in pH changes the enzyme, and the rate is going to change. It's a significant change now, that is what will cause it to be denatured. All right, so if it is not significant, it will not be denatured. It will just start to work slower. All right, so that is it for pH. The final one we have to look at is temperature. And so I'll give you a minute or so, and then I start again. All right, I'm going to erase now.
That is what I'm going to try to do by 2.30. So we're going to do the temperature and then the inhibition part is not, not, it's not too long. Okay. But I will do it even if, if we end at two, two far there. So I am going to do it. All right, so for temperature now, this one is a bit easier. And we are familiar with it from CXE. All right, so temperature. For temperature and pH, it's the bell shaped curve. All right. So, as we know, this temperature here, all right, so I put 0, 50, let's say 25. So, this would be our optimum temperature. We will get our maximum rate. At this point, all right. So that's B max. So this point here, that's V max, our maximum rate. All right. All right. So state the effect. That's the V is for velocity. So it's the maximum velocity or the maximum rate.
I'm continuing it over here. All right, so that is what temperature. So the first half of the graph, let's look at it. This half of the graph over here, that is for this part where we speak about temperature increasing, collision increases and, and rate increasing, right? So this part is the first half of the graph. First half of the graph. That's the explanation for over here. And then this part is for the second half of the graph. All right, so in the first half, no bonds are going to break. It's just about increasing collision and enzyme substrate complex, so the rate increase. Once you get to this point now and beyond, that is where the bonds start to break until the enzyme is eventually denatured.
right, I'll give you the next minute and then I'll clear the board. All right, I'm going to clear the screen also. We have done we have the good properties. So I'm going to do the inhibition of enzymes now.
All right, so in competitive and non-competitive, right? As the name suggests, one inhibitor is competing with the active site. That means it has the same shape as the active site or the complementary shape or the active site. And the substrate would have the same shape. So they are competing for the active site. That is why it is competitive. Because both of them are competing if you increase the amount of substrate, then, the, then, then there's a greater chance that it is the substrate that will bind and not the inhibitor. So increasing the substrate concentration will help. And also the enzyme structure, it is not affected. Now in clusteric or, or non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor is not going to bind to the active site. It is going to bind somewhere else on the enzyme. However, when it does that, it changes the shape of the active site. So what is the purpose of the inhibitor? No, we don't want the inhibitor. No. The inhibitor is going to slow down the, the, the inhibitor is going to slow down the, the the rate of reaction. So like the cyanide poisoning, it's a respiratory inhibitor. Go ahead, Cameron. Sir, so, um for the allosteric inhibition, mm -hmm. you have you have um competing with the enzyme for the active scent. Should it be um the yeah. substrate? Wait for allosteric? Yeah. Which part? In black at the top. It is non-competitive because the inhibitor is not competing. Yes, thank you. Substrate. Answer that right. It is not competing with the substrate. Remember now the purpose of enzymes is to catalyze reaction. They work on substrate. So you don't want inhibitors interfering with that process. Unless it's a reaction you would not want an enzyme to carry out. All right, so I was saying about cyanide poisoning, it's a respiratory inhibitor. It prevents the process of cellular respiration. All right, so you don't want that to happen. So just remember in allosteric, it is binding elsewhere on the enzyme and it is going to change the active site. When you change the active site, the substrate is not going to bind to it. So because the substrate is not binding to your enzyme, it doesn't matter if you increase it because it is not binding to it anyways. Increasing the amount of substrate, it will not help. All right, it will not increase the rate. I want to put some diagrams on the board so everybody finish with the left hand side of the board. I'm going to erase it. All right, so let's just use some diagrams to demonstrate it. All right, so you can understand a little better. All right, so let's start with competitive, right? I'm going to put two enzyme. So these are the enzyme.
this is an this is an inhibitor this is an inhibitor that's the substrate so you realize that this part of each of them right can slot into the enzymes side now we only have one substrate here we have two inhibitors all of them of the same shape so all three of them can bind so these two inhibitors so remember you know, this is an inhibitor so for example let us say the substrate here is maltose we need maltose to be broken down without maltose even protein starch right all of those are substrate that needs to be broken down if you have inhibitor present that means your substrate will not be broken down and that is what you need to happen so if you have inhibitors right that are binding to your enzyme good your substrate will just be there and nothing will happen to it so the inhibitor is preventing your substrate from binding so look you need glucose right a cellular respiration you have an inhibitor that is similar to maltase then starch will not be broken down all right so that is what inhibitors are preventing from happening now because it is competitive look what happens if we increase the amount of substrate let us increase the amount of substrate now Mm -hmm. And about the two inhibitors. You have six substrates, right? And two inhibitors. So what, what are the chances do you think that it is the inhibitor that is going to bind versus the substrate? Which one do you think is more of a higher chance of binding to the enzyme? The substrate or the inhibitor? The substrate. Exactly, right. So that is why for competitive inhibition, increasing the concentration of the substrate will remedy the presence of the inhibitor because you are increasing the chances of the substrate binding to the enzyme instead of the inhibitor. All right. The next thing you should know, right, the, this reduction, right, it will still be going on, but it's just that it is slow. So remember, the inhibitor is not going to stay on the enzyme forever it will come back off. And when it comes off, then a substrate can bind. So it is happening slower, all right? And for that reason also, it is not changing your shape of the enzyme, all right? For competitive, the enzyme shape, it is not affect the shape of your enzyme. You can counteract it by increasing the concentration of the substrate that's for competitive for non-competitive now which is allosteric this is what happens i don't have to draw a box for that let us say right let us say that this hold on I'll do it like this this let us say that this is our Enzyme. This part here, it is the allosteric site. Allosteric site. Remember the allosteric site, that is where the enzyme is going to bind. Sorry, this is where the inhibitor is going to bind. This is the active site. Let me try it again.
when the inhibitor, I'm going to put the inhibitor in blue. Let us say this is our inhibitor. When it binds to the enzyme, it is going to cause the active site to change shape. So let us say the active site, it looks like this now. All right. So if this is your substrate, all right, when the inhibitor binds, do you think the substrate can still bind to the enzyme? What do you think? Inhibitor. No, sir. No, because the inhibitor has changed the shape of the active site. The question is, for this type of inhibition, would increasing the amount of the substrate change change the rate? No, right, that is correct. Over here, inhibitant substrate of the same shape, increasing the substrate will work. But you realize that in this one, the inhibitor change the active site, all right? So that means it doesn't matter how much substrate is there, the fact of the matter is that the active site is no longer what it used to be, all right? So that is why it is non-competitive. Now, you have reversible and you have irreversible, all right? So reversible means that it is a temporary process where the substrate cannot bind. All right. So you have the one that is reversible and you have the one that is irreversible. So when some inhibitors bind to the enzyme, it is going to permanently change the shape. This one, is, this one is the reversible one. So the inhibitor can come off. The active site goes back to what it was, and the substrate can bind. So this process is reversible. So let's make a note that this one is non-competitive, reversible. Let me just put it up here. So the enzyme shape, it's not permanently changed, all right? So that is why it is reversible. That means it can go back to what it was. All right, the inhibitor bind to the enzyme and change the shape of the active site. When the inhibitor leaves, the inhibitor it can come off. we are looking at a process that is reversible. The inhibitor, it binds to the allosteric side, change the shape of the active side. So the ends so of the substrate cannot bind to it. However, all right, hold on. Let me put that back. Let me do a third one. So the inhibitor should leave now. you would get back the enzyme being with the same active site now. Remember now, it is the binding of the inhibitor that changed the active site. So if the inhibitor leaves, the enzyme can get back its original configuration. That is why it is a reversible process. Is that material for you? Yes, sir. And so after this, we are going to look at the non or the reversible one.
All right, so let's go to the irreversible one now, where the active site will be completely changed. I'm going to clear the board, so if you haven't finished, just take a screenshot. All right, clear the screen. All right, by the way, the competitive, both of those were were reversible. So we call them reversible inhibition. So both the competitive that I just showed you and the non-competitive one, those two were reversible because the, there was not a permanent change in the enzyme. This one here, the irreversible one, is when the change is permanent. So the enzyme cannot go back to, to what it was, all right? So when the change is permanent, that is when the inhibition is irreversible. So go ahead, is the person that raised their hand? You have a question? Yes, sir. Sir, okay. so is it that reversible and irreversible inhibitions are types of the allosteric inhibition? Right. So, right. So some of them, so for the competitive one, it is reversible. But for the allosteric one, it can be non, can be irreversible or 
reversible. This one, where it binds to the active site, forms the covalent bond and stays there. It is not going anywhere. That change is permanent. So once it's permanent, it's irreversible. Remember in the previous example, we said that the inhibitor can bind to a different site and come off. That one would be temporary, right? So that is why it is reversible. So the key word here is temporary and permanent. The change is temporary, then it is reversible. If it is permanent, then it is irreversible. So two things inhibit. So it prevents the substrate from binding. That's what makes it an inhibitor. So whether it is competitive or non-competitive, right? Once it prevents the substrate from binding to the active site, that makes it an inhibitor. If it is not a permanent change, that is when we use the term reversible. In competitive, in competitive inhibition, it is reversible because at some point in time, the inhibitor molecule will come off. It's not a permanent change. In the non-competitive one now, where the ends where the inhibitor bind to the cholesteric side, and it will come back off, that part is reversible. But in this instance, where we say it is not coming off, or the change that is made is permanent, then that inhibition is irreversible. But once you have a permanent change in the enzyme, then it is irreversible. Is it any, is it any clearer? Yes, sir. All right. All right, so the, the last thing I need to show you is end product inhibition. So that's a negative, negative feedback mechanism. So if you remember from CSEC, the digestion, when the blood sugar level is high, insulin is secreted to lower it. And when the blood sugar level is low, glucagon is secreted to try and bring it back to normal. This form of inhibition is something just like that, all right? So we call it end product inhibition. End product. inhibition. So let us say, right, we have a substrate. Substrate A goes to substrate B goes to substrate C. And enzyme X so enzyme X converts A B and enzyme Y convert substrate. So A is substrate. All of them are substrate. Substrate, substrate. All right. What do we mean by in product inhibition? In product means the final product. So this is a sequence of events, right? You have A, A is converted to B, and then B is converted to C. So C is your end product. So we are looking at how the end product inhibits the overall process. So let us say this reaction, right? We want to produce C. You need a normal level of C. All right, so three scenarios. One, 
reaction progresses to produce normal levels of compound C, all right? What happens if C is in excess? If C is in excess, it prevents the conversion of A into B. It basically stops the entire reaction from taking place. It is basically inhibiting the reaction from taking place. So when C is in excess, A is not converted to B. So if A is not converted into B, then B is not being converted into C. So this re reaction, it shuts off, all right? So A is not converted to B. B, therefore, is not made. So the production of C stops. All right, so get done. So if C is in excess, it stops the conversion of A into B. So it is basically inhibiting enzyme X. So that is what is happening. Enzyme X is inhibited. Enzyme X is inhibited. So again, end product inhibition. End product it is the final compound in the reaction sequence. When the level of it is high, right, it is going to stop the conversion of A into B by inhibiting enzyme X, all right? High, high levels of your end product inhibits the reaction that starts the process, all right? So that is what end product inhibition is, all right? And so if this is not producing any, this one will also be out of play because for this to be active, we need B to be, we need B to be produced, right? So as a result, if there is no B, we would have no use for X, right? All right, let me see here. If I can explain it over, All right? So we are look. so the term where it comes under inhibition, right? And the term is in product. So we are looking at how the product of a sequence of reactions inhibit the overall process, all right? So the reaction is A produce B, B produce C. This reaction is totally fine, right? But let us say there is an, for some reason, there is an excess of C. And the body or the cell needs to stop the production of C. The high levels of C will inhibit enzyme X. Remember the reaction starts going from A to B. The enzyme X converts A to B. Once A is converted into B, B is going to be converted into C. 
but the cell needs to stop the production of C. So what happens, enzyme X is inhibited due to the high levels of C. The end product is C, high levels of C inhibits enzyme X. So that means enzyme X is not going to convert A into B. If A is not converted to B, B is not converted to C. And so no more C will be made. So the product C is literally preventing the enzyme X from working. It is inhibiting enzyme X. All right, so the term end product is because it is the final product. Inhibition, the final product, is inhibiting a particular enzyme. Is it any clearer? Yes, sir. All right. All right, so there's no real. I'm going to post a question in the community section. You can attempt it till we meet again. So when we meet again, we're going to do that question. Look at cell structure and some stuff from module two. It will be sometime next week again, probably about Tuesday. But just look out for the notification in the community section or maybe whoever sent you the link. We'll send you again. All right. All right, so I'm going to end it here for today. The next chem session, well, I'll, I'll probably have to do one tomorrow. I'm not sure of the time as yet, but I will make a notice in the community section on the channel. All right, you are welcome. All right, thanks. Same to you. All right. So, what else is there? Have a good day. All right.